What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a ton of comic books that have come out this week. And let's kick it off with a big one. Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, number seven, from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson. Art by Juan Sempere, Jack Herbert, Giuseppe Camincoli, and Cam Smith, and Rafa Sandoval. This is the end of Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths as the assembled forces of all of the heroes try to hold back specifically Deathstroke, but kind of the great darkness behind him as it is trying to wreck the new version of the expanded Infinite Earths multiverse. It all comes down to Nightwing, kind of, along with a couple of other characters. I know we've been a little mixed about this event, but how did you feel about the conclusion, Pete? Oh, uh, this was great. I was. Uh, I thought this was uh, wrapped up really nice. Um, some real touching moments. I mean, you know, the spoilers. Uh, you know, Nightwing. Uh, you know, comes through like a Mack truck, kind of saving the day here. And uh, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was a very smart move, well used, well use of Nightwing. Also, the touching moments between uh, Batman and Nightwing were just really well done. I mean, I still thought it was messed up that Batman broke the candle that Nightwing had been saving the whole time. And I was like, yo, don't be a dick, Batman. But uh, overall, I thought this was a, a fun, fun event and well executed. I liked a lot of the ideas in this issue. I kind of wish they had come earlier on. And this is reiterating some of my issues with this event, which, mind you, I appreciate the craft put into it. I like Joshua Williamson as a writer. I thought the art was overall very good across this event. It really fit a big DC event type thing. But the thing about it is like, I love the focus of Deathstroke being the big ultimate bad guy here. And they did start with him as sort of a sub bad guy, but I would have loved to get to it earlier. There was a lot of confusion from me, the reader, in terms of them being like, no, 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 the Great Darkness was nothing. It was just whispering to Pariah. Pariah was crazy. And then a couple of pages later, Deathstroke is like, the Great Darkness is real and it's speaking to me and it's coming and there's more coming soon. And I was like, so which one is it? I'm not quite sure exactly what's going on here. Instead, coming down to this fight of Deathstroke versus Nightwing for all yeah. the marbles, I thought is awesome and i love nightwing being the soul of the dc universe i do think that was mildly undercut by the other missions going out at the same time with the flashes repairing the universe and other characters doing other things that all contributed to this while nightwing was kind of just holding off deathstroke i felt like and i this is very much me backseat writing but just go with it with nightwing don't have any of the other stuff have nightwing be like no, this is what this is how we hold on to the light is Nightwing. Like that is the future of the DC universe. That is the hope in the heart of the DC universe. And it felt like they uh, touched up against that idea, but never fully went into it. It sounds like you disagree, though, Pete. Well, I just think that like it's interesting because you like the Flash, where I was like, yeah, give the Flash something to run about. You know, he can, I can seem busy or seem important, and he's just got to I, I understand what you're faster. saying, but the way that it executes, it sort of feels like the Flashes are like, if we all run fast enough, we can bind the multiverse together. We did it. Thanks for distracting them, Nightwing. And it's, to my mind, doing it that way diminishes the effort of what Nightwing did because everyone was like, thanks, Flashes. You really saved the universe. Oh, also, thank you, Nightwing. Appreciate it. Versus I would have loved to see it the other way around because there was so much good emotional focus that they're getting towards with Nightwing. Uh, I don't know. I'm not good at sports metaphors, but it feels like he got it three quarters of the way down the field and then the Flashes did the touchdown and everybody's like, great touchdown, guys. And Nightwing was like, but... Well, you know, it is, you know, it's important that you, you we're talking about sports at this point because, you know, it is, it, you know, it's really the offensive lineman that does all the work, but it's the wide receiver who always gets to celebrate in the end zone. You know what I mean? So it's kind of, you know, that's like life, you know, the hmm. flash did a lot of important things that nobody cares about because it's the flash and every time he just has to run a little bit faster and he does unbelievable, but uh he did do a part and it's like you know if you're gonna have a stupid character have that stupid character there doing their stupid thing i feel like we're somehow saying the same thing but with opposite characters right now because you hate the flash and i get that yeah uh but anyway i don't know whatever it is <laughs> not uh, great art. art great art there we great go art. hey super type it out as art i as i always like to say <laughs> 
Let's move on to another big event that's running right now on the opposite end of the aisle. I don't know what you call it. Avengers Forever, number 12 oh, from yeah. Marvel, okay. written by Jason Aaron, art by Aaron Cooter. This is the third part, and we're getting a pretty clear structure here now. If We have this kickoff in Avengers Assemble, and then in the main Avengers book, we're going to have the Avengers team and the Avengers from 6 million B.C., fighting the multiversal masters of evil while in avengers forever we're going to have the multiversal team of avengers fighting an army of mephistos among other things now pete why are you I... having tr trouble keeping this all straight it seems pretty f straightforward to me absolutely not i think i just okay. laid it out very easily now, okay pete, i thought about you while i was reading this issue and i know you are anti-mephisto and i get that mm -hmm. and all i want to lay out is like this I'm trying to think how to frame this in a way that you're not going to yell at me suddenly because I'm like, this is awesome because it is awesome. And Aaron Cooter's art is I agree with you. amazing. Mephisto is as evil as Mephisto has ever been. And the fact that you have an issue where there's like a dinosaur Mephisto in the background and a giant robot Mephisto and all these like angry Mephistos fighting an army of Captain Americas from throughout the multiverse teamed up with an army of Captain Marvels throughout the universe and one Thor who is the god of fists. That's right. The god of fists. This rules. I agree. This was a really fun book. I loved it. I thought the the mix them up fun that we're having in this uh, Avengers Forever is just it's a crazy cool idea. I think it's really over the top in all the best ways. Uh, spoilers, but the old man Phoenix was old. Yeah, old man Phoenix was was so cool. I didn't know that I needed that in my life there, but that was crazy cool. And I love the Ant-Man line of like, okay, new plan. Let's just start punching as he jumps off. Just that they're having a great time. It seems like they're having a fun time writing it and putting it out. So yeah, I'm, I'm having a great time. I think it's a hilarious mix of different characters doing different things. And yeah, I mean, I, I sure I was Mephisto wasn't a part of it, but you know, he's a very small part. So it's fine. no, I mean, there's a chameleon of him and he's a very huge part because of the main villain, but I'm trying to is, minimize it here and have fun. So stop pushing me. But the thing that I don't understand that I'm trying to wrap my brain around here is Jason Aaron is writing it as Mephisto is the worst evil in the universe. Everybody hates him. We need to stop and destroy Mephisto. That to me seems like something you would like and identify with. I, I do, and yes, I just wish it wasn't such a huge part of everything. You know? I don't. I, I just, I, there's a wall there. There's a wall there. <laughs> I need to get through that wall somehow. This book is great. Let's move to a new yeah, amazing car. Art. Uh, bananas, tight art. That is super tight. Dead Seas, number one from IDW, written by Kevin Scart, art by Nick Brokenshire. This is a lot of different things going on in this issue. We're going to get into spoilers for it because you got to got to explain spoilers to understand even the basic concepts of the book. But this takes place in a world where ghosts are real, and everybody knows this, and that's the first concept. And then the second concept is there's a guy who's sent to a boat where they keep a bunch of ghosts and they're trying to mine their ectoplasm because they found different uses for it. So that's sort of the second concept there is like, oh, okay, prison boat where they store ghosts. And then the third concept is, and this is definitely getting into spoilers for the issue, but pretty much immediately upon them arriving, one of the ghosts breaks out and goes into the ship and the prisoners are like, screw this, we're having a prison break and taking over the boat. And then there's also some hijacking pirates are gonna come in. So first of all, I'll say like, this book changed rapidly every five sure to ten did. pages or so, in case that isn't totally clear. I love the ideas that are going on here. It is wild to me how many things happened in this first issue, though. Yeah, I mean, this was so intense. This is just great, action-packed first issue that ends in such a great way that makes you just want to read more immediately. So uh, really well done. Some also creepy as shit ghosts. I mean, this yeah. is some scary AF, AF stuff for sure. I, I was just like, uh, you know, it was just kind of like horrible idea, horrible turn of events, just kind of like happening all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, just uh, just really intense first issue. 
It's great. Uh, I, again, could not believe where I was like, oh, this is a nice, clear concept for a book. Oh, this is also a nice, clear concept. Oh, there's more. OK. Yeah. All right. We're still going. I should stop saying that. <laughs> I'm trying to get a grasp on this because it's going to keep changing. changing. Yeah. But like you said, I'll just add on and reiterate, Nick Brokenshire's designs for the ghosts are so weird and upsetting. Yeah. Really good stuff. So definitely check but out. I do like this idea that like if ghosts are real, let's just trap them on a ship and kind of put them out in the sea where they can't hurt anybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. There you go. Like in real yeah. life, because ghosts are real. Yeah. Let's talk Crazy. about a second issue to one of my favorite books of last month, Chroma Number 2 from Image Comics oh, by yeah. Lorenzo Di Felici. This takes place in a world where the remaining humans or human-ish characters are all black, white, and gray. They're scared of this guy, the Lord of Colors, who sends giant monsters against them. We've already learned that the things are not exactly how everybody see thinks. At the end of the last issue, the main character that we were following got impaled and killed, and now we're following who we thought was the secondary character in this issue. There's another big cliffhanger at the end here. I know we all love the first issue, so how do you feel the second issue stood up? It's, I yeah, I love the first issue. I'm blown away by the second issue. Just wow, crazy roller coaster of adventure and action. Amazing characters, amazing use of color. Uh, highlighting just emotion and heightening it uh, as far as the characters wants and power just so great i hated the last panel but i was supposed to mm -hmm. and it's it i'm just so hyped for the next issue it, it's just i was just so all in by the end of the the issue I, they did such a cool job i love the main character i love the different colored eyes such a cool idea and great use of color um absolutely blown away by the concept of this and then the execution this is a gorgeous book to look at i was most nervous after the immense amount of world building in the first issue but i think what the second issue does is it really hooks you even more on the emotional story now that we have that world building out of the way i also love there's a little note at the end where uh, lorenzo de felici says wow another cliffhanger at the end here probably not as big as the last one but that's okay there's bigger ones coming and my reaction was like oh no, <laughs> no stop characters. stop it <laughs> stop. stop hurting my friends yeah. This book is exactly. great, though. Do not miss it by any means. Next up, the first of many Dark Web stories that we're going to be talking about in this stack. Dark Web Miss Marvel, number one from Marvel, written by Perzada, art by Francesco Mort Mortarino. I don't know why I had a problem with that name. I'm sorry. But this is spinning, of course, out of the Dark Web event where Ben Riley, who is now going by the name Chasm, and Madeline Pryor, the Goblin Queen, have teamed up to bring a new Inferno on the Marvel Universe to do something to Spider-Man and the X-Men. We don't know exactly what it is yet. But Miss Marvel, since she is currently interning for Spider-Man over at Oscorp, gets caught in the mix in the middle here. It brings back some old characters from the Miss Marvel run. I'll tell you what, I think this was my favorite issue of Miss Marvel since G. Willow Wilson's run. I agree. I was really blown away by this. It really brought me back to such a great place with Miss Marvel. This book was a ton of fun. Great art, great story. Love the chemistry going on here. Love the action. Uh, just this was just such a, a well done issue. STB art. Uh, yeah, I was I was really impressed by this. Yeah, it really digs into a lot of the stuff that the original run did really well in terms of Miss Marvel's culture, but also it has humor. It has some exciting action in it. It really digs into her character. And I'm always very hesitant about these spin-off books that tie into events, but this is the sort of thing that I would love as a kickoff for a new Miss Marvel series because I think this team really, really crushed it here. So I'm very the happy. The evil bird kind of villain was such a cool uh, character as well. I love him. He is from the original run as well, the eventer. So bringing yeah. him back from hell makes a lot of sense. I don't know how they're going to wrap up all these plot lines in a second issue. There's enough here to launch a six issue miniseries. So very exciting. Oh, yeah. Catwoman number 50 from DC Comics, written by Teeny Howard, art by Nico Leon, Anaka Miranda, and Juan Ferreria. This is finishing up a big storyline of Punchline versus Catwoman. The Pete, I know you were super into. Yeah. So what did you think about the finale here? This was fun. This was solid Catwoman story. I, uh, I love the I love you's uh, great art. Uh, love the backup in the second half as well. Just this is the... Uh, I was really impressed with this Catwoman book. 
Yeah, I like the front story. I think it was a solid Catwoman story. I'm still not into the whole punchline thing the way that you are. But that second story, like you said, really cool, very different. Talk about the big change in status quo for Catwoman here. She gets thrown into jail at the end. So the second story is following her as she is in jail and she's interacting with people there. I thought this was really interesting. We've certainly seen heroes or anti-heroes in jail before. Daredevil recently comes to mind. But I thought this was a good take on it. And I like seeing Catwoman in this situation, and I thought it was interesting. So very curious to follow this book going forward. Next up, another final issue here, Breakout, number four, from Dark Horse Comics, written by Zach Kaplan, art by Wilton Santos. In this series, kids are being taken by mysterious cubes, and over the course of the series, we have found out exactly who's behind these cubes. In the last issue, the kids take the final battle to the masters behind the cubes in order to stop them from kidnapping children and uh, killing them. I know we were very big on this series when it started off. How did you feel about the conclusion? This was really amazing. This almost felt like a movie. This was Mm -hmm. such a great kind of like action payoff uh, kind of ending. I loved the way it ended. It was so uh, very exciting, amazing art. This was a great, they they really landed it here. I think they did a great job of like setting it up and they really stuck the landing on this issue. It was really impressive. I do think, I agree with you on the movie thing. This definitely feels like a movie pitch in comic book form, yeah. which is fine. I would love to see this movie. I think this would be very fun. I do think great. in terms of pacing over the four, th- four issues, was a little off sometimes after a first issue that I thought was very, very strong. We stayed in the heist planning part a little too long and then rushed through the actual breaking into the cube finale thing a little quickly and a little easily, frankly, given the impossibility of the enemies they were facing. But it's the sort of thing that I think I I would guess this is a proof of concept for a movie pitch. And if it does come to be a movie... I don't know. They'll work it out. They'll go through different script iterations and they'll sort of massage that pace a little bit. But as a creative idea, I thought this was fun and I'm glad that I read all four issues. Yeah. There you go. What's the furthest place from here, Pete? Number Uh, nine. What's the furthest place from here? Number nine. That was a very awkward transition. That didn't work. From Image Comics, written by, I believe, Sweeney Boo with Matthew Rosenberg and Tyler Boss. Art by Sweeney Boo. This is a issue that is going back in time and showing, filling in a bunch of things that have been going on in the background of this issue. That's what we've been doing, I believe, the past couple of issues, presumably to let the team catch up and get ahead on other things. So we get Sweeney Boo art. We get Sweeney Boo writing. But I thought this was a great issue, really emotionally told, very sad, really fit in tonally with the whole series. How would you feel about it, Pete? Yeah, this is such a cool, creative, fun story. Uh, Spoilers, but it turns out you can't trust an adorable frog person. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is intense, but great storytelling and a heightened environment. Uh, Some real cool twists and turns, but really just a great example of what you can do with comic books that you can't do in other forms and yeah this is just this is just impressive comics right here this is a really good issue that i wouldn't necessarily reading as a one shot on its own but if you did want to pick it up you absolutely could read it as a one shot and then go back and have this iteration at your disposal for the first eight issues that's how good it is the series is great i love it Another Dark Web issue, Dark Web, Mary Jane and Black Cat, number one from Marvel, written by Jed McKay, art by Vincenzo Caradu. This is following the titular two characters who are once again mixing it up in the middle of this Dark Web event. This is the first of two parts, so it doesn't quite finish up here. But as usual with the Jed McKay book, when he's writing about Black Cat, and as he showed us when he did the Mary Jane and Black Cat Beyond book, tying into the previous iteration of Amazing Spider-Man when Ben Reilly was at the helm, He writes this duo really well, and he writes their history with Peter Parker very well, where they're trying to help each other out, but there's this weird unspoken thing. We got a big twist in terms of the status quo of Mary Jane going on here that's a huge reveal, particularly if you've been reading Amazing Spider-Man. We haven't even gotten a hint of this yet, which I thought was fascinating. What'd you think, Pete? This was uh, just a good art, interesting team up. Uh, You know, I think Jim and Kate does Black Cat really well, so it's fun to see him kind of in his wheelhouse. And fun last page. Yeah, 
I am very interested to see what's going on with Mary Jane. I think that's interesting. And we got one of my favorite weird characters from Marvel history who shows up on the last page. Yeah. So definitely a pickup, particularly if you've been enjoying the Dark Web event. I can't believe all of these one shots are good. Let's talk, or these spinoffs are good. Stargirl, The Lost Children, number two from DC Comics, written by Jeff Johns, art by Todd Nock. This is following Stargirl and Amiko, who is, I guess, Red Arrow or Arsenal. Not 100% sure what she's going by, but they are teaming up to find a bunch of missing sidekicks who, in playing on real-life continuity, Jeff Johns and company are being like, hey, why did these sidekicks just kind of fall out of the collective unconscious? Turns out there's a reason for that. They've all been kidnapped and taken to this weird island for orphan sidekicks. That's where Stargirl and Amiko end up towards the end of the episode. There's a bunch of weird stuff that they discover there. episode issue. Issue. Sure. It feels like an episode, though. Let's be honest. <laughs> what do you think, Pete? Uh, love the art. The story was really fun. Uh, it's a good team up. I love the two of them together. And uh, I like the emotional moment in the Arrow Cave there uh, with the Bat Cave riff offline. That was funny. Uh, really pumped for the next issue. I think they did a great job uh, on this. I think this does what Jeff Johns does best, which is digging into history of the DC universe, finding forgotten corners of it and bringing it forward in a way that is emotionally grounded for the main character. So if you like Stargirl, if you're bummed that it was canceled on the CW, check out this book. I think check it out. Check it out. You won't be disappointed. Something is Killing the Children, number 27 oh, from Boom Studios, go. written by James here Tyner IV, art by Werther Del Daria. JT4. Pete, do you want to just take it away? I know you love this one. This is amazing, all caps. Why are you not reading this comic? This is great. This I is. Am. We reviewed it, Pete. I'm not talking to you. Oh, okay? okay, it's not always okay. about you. Okay. All right. Uh, I I just this is such a great last page. I am so hyped for the next issue. STB, bro, come on, pick this shit up you won't be sorry get on the bus gus this was a great issue of this comic book with some huge twists like you're saying i hesitate to mention them here but our main character erica is down and out she's been severely injured there's a monster on the loose there's also a rogue member of the house of slaughter who is after her and looking to kill her big movie here at the end that surprises both our villain and us, the reader that I thought was awesome. Oh. Man, I cannot wait for the next issue of this book. You know, we talk a lot, or at least Justin often talks a lot, how every issue of this feels like sometimes a little too much of a meal, like it's a little bit of an appetizer. This is not just a full meal, this issue, but it's a full meal that made me hungry and starving for the next full oh, meal. Oh, yeah. They, can't wait. They, they did such a great job of with this comic like building out this world slowly little bit at a time mm -hmm. and the the confidence with which they did that was so great and this really is paying off in this issue and i feel like the next issue even more it's been really impressive to see them confidently kind of set this all up in such an amazing way that's about to pay off and man i cannot wait the art is just, oh, it's worth it for the art alone. It's just, this is such a great package and totally worth it. Rogue Sun, number nine from Image Comics, written by Ryan Parrott, art by Marco Reyna. This has been one of my favorite titles in the massive verse. And here we finally get a worthy adversary for the new Rogue Sun as a guy who has been granted nearly unstoppable powers comes to kill him and threaten his whole family. You know, I thought they did a really good job of setting up his arch villains with his mom in the first arc. But here, this villain is even better and even more personal. He's so directed. It's like, it's almost a Deathstroke level intensity of like, yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. I'm going to take you down. You got to do this thing. I'm yeah. going to kill everybody you know. Let's just, you know, get past it so I can just do this thing. And that level of danger for our character, who is usually very flip about everything, yeah. is a great contrast there's a big twist at the end that I'm very excited to check out more. This continues to be one of my favorite comics coming out from Image. Yeah, it's another solid comic. I mean, this uh, we spent some more time like with the human kind of part of them, but it's not always suited up all the time, which is cool. Uh, great ending. I love the choices being made. I, I, you know, I'm not really excited for the you know the prom stuff, but I'm still so here for this comic. 
looking forward to the next issue. This is just, uh, this is great art, great writing, total package. X-Men Annual number one from Marvel, written by Steve Fox, art by Andrea DeVito. This is taking the new iteration of the X-Men team and sending them off on various missions, but it's very focused in particular on Firestar, who is on the new iteration of the X-Men team, and what her place is both on the X-Men as well in the Marvel Universe. I was very surprised about this. I thought this was really emotionally grounded. Firestar is a character that I've never really been into or interested in, but I thought the way that they delved into her psychology here and really pushed her and explored her and how she was feeling about things and kept everything centered on that, I thought it was really smartly written and very carefully written, and I appreciated that. Great, I'm glad you're having fun with it. I mean, to me, it all summed up when Iceman was like freezing drinks and being petty. Like, what are we doing? All right, uh, you were you know, too I'm... focused on the Krakoa thing. What is something that you liked about this book that obviously had nothing to do with Krakoa? Right? Don't make me change my review. I'm gonna finish my review. Well, I, you know, okay, but are you gonna end with something you liked? Uh, nope. I, I mean, they're just sitting on an island beefing with each other. You know that's what I mean? That's literally just the beginning. That's the framing device. That's Shut the beginning and the end. What about the and let me of the talk. Book? What about the middle of the book? I, you know, I just, I, I'm just so frustrated with what they're doing with the X-Men. It's like, you know, let me know when you're back in the mainland. Have fun on your island vacation. I, I don't know what you guys are doing here, but great. Good for you. I, you're very right about this. What over. if I told you? the middle of the book all took place on the mainland and had nothing to do with the island. Yeah, I read it, man. They they went through the fucking portal, checked it out for a little bit, and then went running back to their fucking island. Either stay there or don't. I, I'm just, I don't know, man. This, oh, okay. I so just, would you say I, the I, same I, thing for people who live on real islands? They should stay on their islands? Is that what? No. Is no. that your ethnocentrism poking its head through, Pete? No, I don't I don't have any problems with people who live on islands or real Just to be life. clear, anybody listening to the Stack Podcast right now, if you live on an island, Pete <laughs> says stay there. No. For example, not. I live on Brooklyn, which is part of Long Island. I'm never leaving. Great. I'm staying. Good for I'm you. not going into Manhattan even. That's a different island. Okay. Uh, well, you not know that's Staten that. Island. You work on in Manhattan, so you're never lying going back already. again because Pete, my friend, told me not to. I got to stay on my island, right, Pete? I just why do I listen? If you decided to leave me, okay, mm -hmm. and then we're I constantly would, just constantly telling me about your island adventures, mm -hmm. I would be like, you know what? That's great, dude, but like, I'm not into it because I'm not a part of that island. That's your choice that you made to go live on that island. And if you're all fighting and uh, complaining about, you know, that poor bartender who's like, hey, stop, you guys keep knocking over the drinks. Like, uh, what are we doing? You know what I mean? Maybe you need to come off your island of hating islands and explore the mainland of the middle of comics that don't have anything to do with that. Anyway, this is a good story. If you want to check it out, I was surprised. If you're a fan of the characters back in the day from Spidey and His Amazing Friends, there's also a very good joke about that in here, yeah. um, as there always is. But I really like this issue a lot. Let's talk about Nightwing number 99 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Bruno Redondo and Geraldo Borges. This is another big issue for Nightwing with huge things going on here and big status quo changes. Every issue of this is great. Take it away, Pete. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love this issue. It continues to be such a huge... Uh, Nightwing right now is killing it over at DC. Just like one of the best comics that DC is doing. Uh, the art is STB. Uh, it's just... Uh, I, 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 it's great. It continues to be great. Uh, it was fun. It was a total blast. Well, I'm going to throw something out at you that I was very surprised about in a pleasant way. I expected by this point that we're getting to issue 99. What we'd be doing is really delving into the arc of this character. I think I keep misremembering the name, but I think it's Heartbreaker uh, who is stealing hearts throughout the city that's been threaded through the background. I thought we were going to be going right into that and it would be like issue 99, issue 100, and then 101 deals with ramifications or however you want to structure it. Instead, 
we have something new happens here where I think it's Tony Zuko, the gangster. I keep wanting to say Tony Moroni, but I know that's not his name. <laughs> Comes back to town and threatens Nightwing, also threatens the mayor, who is the half-sister of Nightwing. And Nightwing discovers this whole area of Bloodhaven that he's never known anything about before, some big secret that he's going to have to explore in the future. So one issue before issue 100, and they lay out at the end all of these different threats and things that are coming for him. Um, this is still like adding new information here, which is wild to me because there are any other comic book would be six issues deep into a heartbreaker arc where they had fought a bunch of times. Instead, we're getting new stuff and it's exciting every issue. I love it. The Vampire Slayer number nine from Boob Studios, written by Sarah Galley, art by Hannah Templer. In this issue, Buffy has been kidnapped by a giant spider lady and her friends are going to get her. Willow is going a little far with her dark magic as she's teamed up with Faith. She is the Vampire Slayer. However, the spider lady is confused because Buffy is supposed to be the Vampire Slayer. We're getting more hints about something that went wrong in the past. So I am definitely starting to feel like Okay, we can we can reveal what it is. You can tell us what's going on with Buffy at this point, but I assume we'll find out by issue 12 for the anniversary issue. Regardless, I love this book. Uh, how do you feel, Pete? Yeah, this is a cool, heightening, exciting, and fun, uh, great art and action. Uh, they're doing a great job with this book. And just in terms of character relationships, I think I mentioned this before, but Spike and Xander being together is just a phenomenal duo, particularly Spike giving Xander relationship advice, I thought was very fun. There's some really cool artistic choices in here in terms of the characters as they're exploring the cave. There's a cross section of it that I thought was very nice. It looks like a 2D video game, but this book is going so much harder than I expected every issue. It really is making me love Buffy the Vampire Slayer again. Another book from Jeff Johns, Junkyard Joe, number three from Image Comics, written by Jeff Johns, art by Gary Frank. In this issue, Junkyard Joe, the robot, is back with his old partner from the Vietnam War and helping him out around the house. Meanwhile, a new family has moved in next door who is having some hard family issues of their own. This, I would say, was my favorite issue of this book so far, yeah. mostly because... The first two issues have threaded in. The first issue all dealt with back in the day in the video and not more. Second issue felt like almost this new pilot of here's this new situation for these characters and here's some new characters to meet. Here, finally, the thing that they've been seeding in the background in terms of PTSD from the war with soldiers that they've been not hinting out but outright saying, particularly with the ads for real life help organizations in the back, comes to the forefront here in a very surprising way. And I was very emotionally touched by this issue. How did you feel, Pete? Yeah, I, I think it is very touching, very well done. Uh, great kind of comment on, you know, post-traumatic stress and, uh, you know, um, it's one of those things where it's like an old man and his robot is something we've seen before, you know what I mean? But I'm, I'm saying that not as a negative thing because this is done in such a touching way. And uh, and I also like that even a robot can have PTSD, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's such a huge thing, it can kind of affect anybody. So I really think that's a cool take. And uh, it's impressive that uh, we're getting this emotional about a man and his robot, you know what I mean? Yeah. And absolutely. also... Of course, the art is uh, super bananas tight. Yes, Gary Frank, always reliable. Gold Goblin, number two from Marvel, written by Christopher Cantwell, art by Lan Medina. This is another dark web tie-in as Gold Goblin deals with some ghosts, some real ghosts, and some imagined ghosts from his past. Try to figure out, can he be a goblin? Can he be different than a goblin? Is he still the green goblin? We talked about this with the first issue, but it seems consistent here. This is very much like the Thunderbolts run where Norman Osborn was in charge of the Thunderbolts and tried to hold it together and you knew he was going to fall apart at some point. So there's sort of that sort of Damocles over his head the entire time. But I think they're channeling that very well. I like that run and it's working for me here. Cool. Uh, I... <laughs> Pete? <laughs> I just... That's the point for you to talk. Okay, yeah, I just you kind of uh, you know kind of died out quickly on me there. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know what to kind of really say about this comic because it's taking more turns than I wanted to. Um, but I don't know, the art's great. And for another opinion on Gold Goblin, why don't we go over to our co-host who has just joined us, Justin Tyler? Hi, Justin. We're talking. I'm about more of a 
we're I'm talking a about correspond- Gold Goblin. I'm more of a okay. correspondent. At we're going to go point. to uh, Justin on the street beat with his opinion on Gold Goblin number two. Take it away. Yeah, Justin. the wind is pretty crazy out here in this Gold Goblin review. Like, the storm's really picking up, and this goblin is trying to move past his sins. Yep. All right, so I guess you didn't have much more of an opinion on it. Why don't we move on and talk about <laughs> No, I have plenty of opinion. Um, I actually like this. I, I've started to enjoy this um, as these issues continue on. Like the Norman Osborn thing <clears throat> felt like a gimmick uh, from the jump where I was like, this guy is not trustworthy and he may not be. But I think we've settled into something where it does feel like he is this now. Um, and we're getting to see him find his own antagonist. Um, the Gwen ghost thing is interesting mm-hmm. and something that we maybe don't, maybe the least welcome part of the uh, goblin mythology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess we'll see what happens with it. I think it's going to be interesting to follow, and I'm curious to see, given how hard they're digging into, like, Norman Osborn is a good guy now, for real, where I, are, it's not going to last too long. Right? I'm just not buying that, and I'm not liking this dude, and then I'm not liking the choices that are happening, and it's hard for me to, like, find an in when it's just keep making these choices that are just... Uh... Uh, listen, man, think about it this way. If... Oh, who's a character who's been really bad? Mephisto. Mephisto, like, if he was trying to do some good stuff and make some amends, you'd have to let him, right? Like, that's that's the right thing to do. I want to see a comic where there's just like so much Mephisto. You know what I mean, Laura? This is like all Mephisto. Does anyone have a dream about that? Hmm. Is that a comic? If you hey, real quick, have you guys talked about a comic? <laughs> we have. Maybe yes. we have. And as it turns out, Pete liked that comic just a little bit. Oh, that's yeah. what I call a twist. Yes. What are we twisted on over to our next comic, though? GCPD, The Blue Wall, number three from DC Comics, written by John Ridley, art by Stefano Raphael. This comic is following a bunch of different rookies in the Gotham City Police Department, as well as Renee Montoya. In particular, in this issue, we focus in on Renee, who is going very hard on Two-Face, believes he has been responsible for some bad stuff in the city. Of course, Two-Face is like, no, I didn't do any of that. But everybody knows it's only a matter of time, very similar to Norman Osborn, that Two-Face is going to fall off the wagon again. Um, I really like this book. This book gets very dark, and it really does not let its characters off the hook at any point, so it makes it tough to read, but purposely so. How do you guys feel three issues in? Well, if you've ever wondered, like, hey, I wonder what it would be like to be a cop in Gotham. I mean, this book does tackle that. Um, And I do... I, it was interesting to kind of be in the room for the conversation with Renee and Two Face, and his kind of being like, "Yo, uh, find somebody else. I'm I'm not that guy." So it's an interesting take. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of cops struggles though in this, which is weird. It's interesting to me that um, this book isn't called Gotham Central. A comic mm-hmm. that was very well received when it came out. It was like a, a good comic that really had a lot of readers. And that's really what it is. Like um, going forward, it's like Renee Montoya um, bringing in some like real incontinuity issues where she's obsessed with Two Face. That's been her thing for a while through. Uh, I don't know if it wasn't Trinity, but it was one of maybe it was New 52 where she was um, obsessed with with him and like dealing with him a book or or sort of around one of those events and Uh, well in 52 she was the question right so i think it was it was before that before that yeah Yeah. um oh yeah you know what i'm thinking of is um it's when he was sort of good for a while during Mm -hmm. um dmz yeah maybe i think it was gotham central is when most of the stuff happened yeah, there, there, there was a, an ongoing series where they were really connected, and he, right. I, I thought it was DMC, but um, anyway, uh, they, they're continuing those storylines forward here in a way that feels very uh, true to that, and so I'm surprised it has sort of this whole new idea attached to it. Yeah. It's good stuff, though. It's very deep, hard to read uh, for a variety of reasons. I think, Pete, what you were getting at, not to call you out, but you feel uncomfortable reading cops in books. Is that what's going on? No, no. I'm just saying if it's it's a hot topic, it's Mm -hmm. a, you know, and it's, you know, 
uh, what you had kind of mentioned where it doesn't it's it's not kind of hiding out you know the struggles of you know the cops and stuff like that so it's just um you know maybe something that isn't something that people would want to jump into right now Mm -hmm. um so you know, I wouldn't be, say this book is like pro cop. Just to be, I clear. wouldn't say that either. But it's like you've got to spend a lot of time with the cops in Gotham. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's like I, I don't know. I like that. I like the idea of these young cops coming in with this idealism of we're really going to change things in Gotham and finding out not only are they probably not, but things are going to get worse for them personally. And then you have this specter of the future in Renee Montoya where you're like, hey, even if I work it up to commissioner, I'm still going to be totally screwed up at the end of the day. Everything is still going to be awful for me, probably even worse than it is now. And that to me, it's not it's not even anti cop necessarily, but I think it's more realistic about the challenges you're facing in terms of joining any sort of law enforcement of it is an uphill battle, no matter what your ideals are. It's very in-world cop, um, mm-hmm. and I think it, it embraces both the positives of, like, they, uh, you know, are out there trying to protect the people of whatever city they work in, but also the negatives, where you have <clears throat> this cop that comes, um, at, <laughs> is, is harassed but, yeah. uh, through the, the uh, bulletin board, and I love, I thought it was so great, the flash you get in this issue of Renee when a picture was posted of her exposing her um, in I won't spoil what it was, but in uh, earlier continuity, and to to do that, it was such a powerful use of that, and so subtly done without sort of really forecasting it, just being like, you know, this happened if you've been following this character. I thought that it was, it, there's just a lot of really well done stuff here. I wouldn't want someone to be turned off because it's just about cops, because I, I don't think it's it's not copaganda by any. Right. It's no police academy mission to Miami or anything like that. Exactly. Oh, the oh, biggest propaganda mm-hmm. uh, thing. And I know, Pete, you love that feature. Yeah, yeah. Huge fan. Um, the the art is also really good. Yeah. Yeah. Hitomi, number three from Image Comics, written by H.S. Talk, art by Isabella Mazzanti. This is following a young girl who wants vengeance on the man who killed her parents. Little does she know, the man that she has joined together with to train to be a Ronin is none other but that man. They become mercenaries in this issue and go on a little bit of an adventure. Pete, I have to imagine, because this basically was like straight up uh, any sort of Ronin vengeance style story you've ever read. You probably love this, right? Yes, this continues to be a monster. Just such a great story that is unraveling before us. Each issue gets better and deeper. Uh, the art is a master class in color and character. It is absolutely beautiful. It is such a crazy, cool story. I fucking love it! Let me ask you this, Pete. This versus like uh, an Usagi Yojimbo comic, which sort of feels like it's in similar territory, but a little less, uh, maybe a little younger, more all ages, you could even say, to Usagi. Mm-hmm. What do you prefer? Well, right now I'm digging this. I mean, but uh, mm. U- Usagi Ojimbo is very much my childhood. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all that wrap, wrapped up. In the, so, like, uh, you know, that takes me to a happy place. But this mm. is a little bit more colorful. This is a little bit uh, maybe a deeper story that we're kind of telling, a little bit more of a fable, if you will. I'm uh, There's a lot more fable. layers to this. Um, in some aspects, but I don't want to take anything away from uh, Stan Sakai. I mean, the guy is an absolute master. No, I was more interested in your taste because this feels like if you came in loving the Usagi, this feels like a natural step forward where it is. A, there's a little more depth to it. There's a little more like interpersonal uh, character play between each of these main characters. There's some just straight up murder. Which yeah, I know it's a little you're darker. A fan of. Yeah, definitely a little darker. And let me also throw out, um, unrelated to this, um, I was just working on a show, uh, on a a commercial out in LA. One of the people working there was like, hey, uh, I wanted to give this to you. It's an Eastman and Laird TMNT book. And um, my first thought was, wow, my co-host Pete is going to be insanely jealous of this. What what, what, what did did they hand you? What was it? 
You know what I'm going to do? It's right in the other room. I'm going to run and go get it. If you okay. could, um, is there any way you have an opinion you could talk about for like, uh, like another like ten seconds? Or yeah, like sure, that? definitely could do that. Uh, okay. Eastman and Laird, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was the thing that got me into comics. The kind of the claws that kept me going back every Wednesday for more. It kind of really stoked my fire. Uh, I just felt like the black and white rendition of these uh, mutant ninjas was such a cool creative thing that kind of really melted my mind so i'm excited to see what issue it is and what it's too close to the camera you got oh i have that issue i have that i have that you issue. want to read out what it is yeah i have that uh, i was just showing that it was it was original 1980s uh limited to each um it's book 18 um february 1989 it's a great, mm. great story. They go to like a Chinese restaurant and the guy keeps trying to add MSG to their food and they're like, no, man, stop messing up my food. It's really great. I love that you can name that from the cover and uh, shouts to Dan Fredrickson, um, my uh, cameraman on the uh, Mountain Dew commercial I just shot. And oh, this, wow. uh, Dude, this I can't believe you done. got to shoot a Mountain Dew commercial and then you got Eastman. It's like, <laughs> whose life are you leading right now? <laughs> I should be doing these things. This is crazy. Uh, Pete, honestly, if if this keeps going, and like if I can find a way to get you involved, like I'm there. I'm here oh for you. Oh my god! Come on. I'll tell you man. what. I don't uh, confession. I don't drink the dew. So oh. I feel like if you were there, it would have been a huge opportunity for yeah. some dude to be drunk. <laughs> uh, guy who had to do the comic was like, hey, man, we're getting rid of Miss Fisto from the comics, by the way, just so you know. Just for you. Uh, just for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my, that's my second. That's when dude, I get a that's true a, genie. That's wish. a valuable comic right there, bro. Like, yeah. don't mess that up. Keep I know, that in he, the back. He gave board. it to me. It was so nice. It yeah. was so nice. Also, I have this garbage plate I'm not going to eat if you want it. Oh, my God. What is happening right so now? So, what is it? This is a bag and board you're saying, Pete? What is oh. this for? <laughs> Stop. Put that back you, in there. Yeah. That makes Put it more fun to fold in, in half. To fold. It's yeah. like a fun fan. What do you do with oh this? Oh my god! Because why? It's, it's like a. Put it's like that a sandwich. Masterpiece of art back into that bag and board where it belongs. It. So you put you this the comic in here, and then you wrap up the leftover of your sandwich, oh god, and you stop. put that in the fridge. I Is that what you, you do? I hate you so much. I don't know. I just don't know what the plastic's for. In the cardboard, it's for drawing a little picture on, I guess. Oh my hmm. god! Uh, this. If, it depends on which version, but just so you know, if it's a really good quality, it's either twenty dollars or ninety dollars. It's yeah, I was gonna say that's a it's fucking... very good quality. This is a mint. This is a mint. Stop <laughs> touching it. You're the the value's dropping. Uh, what a fun thing to watch the value drop in real time. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. Wait, which cover is it? This is I think this is cover B or C. The way that I'm looking at it, uh, uh, I'm gonna pause I'll, sh- I'll show it to you again. Um, and then no, I'll it'll try say to the first page and the inside. It'll tell you what cover it is. Um, Wait, but you see. shouldn't open it. Find out what's inside, but don't touch it. I guess there's um, fun adventures from these mutant ninja teenage turtles. Oh I'm God. saying that. I'm saying that correctly, right? No, no, they're you're not. turtles. But All right, they're we gotta get back to the teenage. stack here. Come on, no, this is really Stop interesting. My I want to. I, I want to find out how much this is. Well, anyway, I'll it, find out another it, time, I guess. It perhaps has some real value. It does. Tell you what, I'm going to enjoy eating it's this. It's a great dish. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy um, reading this after a great, during a great uh, pasta fazool. Oh, <laughs> like a real spicy out of the stack aisle right over in your basement. It's just going to be put on a pile. Oh. Um, I'm going to break into your house it, and rescue that I'll tell comic. you what. I'll tell you what, Justin, and then let's. We really got to move on to the next review, okay? I this is probably worth at least twenty dollars. I will give you twenty dollars if you turn around right now on camera and feed that comic to your dog. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Pip. Pip wouldn't do it. Pip doesn't slip. Mm-hmm. Pip's not going to eat. We'll see. No. no, Pip no. loves comics. He's hungry for comics. <laughs> no. He loves black Pip's and white too comics. Too much of an amazing dog. No way. No, I'm gonna go file this away at the end of like at the end of Raiders when the arc goes into that <laughs> big room. Smart. That thing could pay for your kid's college. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> your college costs about twenty bucks, right? Al- Alien number four from Marvel, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Julius Ota. In this issue, a bunch of androids who invaded a planet infested with aliens are Things are not turning, they're not going their way, I guess I would say. Uh, um, some things get even worse with some new weird alien species by the end. What'd you guys think about this one? I I was really impressed by this. This continues to 
be new and fresh in this thing we've seen so many different ways. I love the moves that they're making, the fun twists and turns. STB art bra. And, uh, yeah, that uh, the eyeball shit really freaked me the fuck out. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I... Uh, the the way we talked about the the first run of these where it was like, wow, way to hit the alien yeah. tropes. Yeah. Well, feeling fresh, but not changing the formula. And it feels like with this arc, it's like, oh, we're sort of reinventing the whole thing, but in a way that still feels true to the original um, alien mythology, where we have sort of a progression in how um, the threat, I, I'm trying to say this without spoiling much, but how the threat is brought to the um, the people, uh, to our protagonists. And I, I think it really works. It still has a similar stakes. It's scary in the right ways. Um, but the flip of the, um, the humans versus the non-humans versus the aliens and the different sort of uh, way they beat each other is really interesting. Deceased War of the Undead Gods, number five from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Trevor Harrison and Neil Edwards. Enter Mr. Mizaplizix, who is trying to help out the universe that is being taken over by a zombified anti-life equation. Some big moves go on here among various characters. Things get exponentially worse, as they always do in a Tom Taylor book. Pete, you seem pretty jazzed about this one. Take it away. Yeah, this is just very over-the-top DC fun. Uh, you know, the uh, Mixoplick turned bad, very scary, a cr crazy heightening of a story. It's very intense. I thought it was really well done. And uh, with such a kind of like fun title, they're really kind of amping it up and uh, answering the call. So I was impressed. You never want to see a goof go bad. Mr. Yeah. Mitzelplick is usually just like a fun, fun boy, yeah. just coming around. Hey, I'm messing just things messing up. Just messing with him. Like, yeah, exactly. It's like when Robin Williams did one hour photo and you were like, oh, uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't want this flavor from you, sir. I want to, I'll rewatch I'll, Mrs. Doubtfire, I guess. Don't, how dare you? Don't besmirch the Williams. I'm not, that's not besmirching. He, I think Robin Williams very much made a choice that in his career, like he wanted to do darker, more dramatic fare. Very fair point for a human. I think he contained multitudes and wanted to do different things. The, this is a, a literal clown man in a DC comic <laughs> who they're like, you know what? He's the one that's going to fuck all this shit up. And it's a su very surprising turn. Very yeah. fun. I feel like it uh, It really works. Seeing Darkseid in the yellow underoos. Oh, also man. Sort of that's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He really fills out the the Sinestro core you know I don't know what you're trying yeah. to say about it as a figure but I don't appreciate oh my God, it just like has he been spandex. working out has he been working out I think he's been working out don't, let me just say like after your when you're dark side body. when you're dark side and you've done enough in your life like why are you wearing such very tight spandex mm -hmm. I don't know the way he's dressed makes me want to turn to the dark side you know oh my god yeah. <laughs> true <laughs> cult yeah. number five from idw written by scott brian wilson art by liana congas this is the final issue of this series about a bunch of fast food employees that are fighting against the devil different devil in the earlier one pete so you don't need to get upset about it yeah i really like how this series tied up it stayed slacker and ridiculous to the very end even with yeah. the solution i'm gonna put in quotes here to what goes on because it's definitely the last issue of the book but it doesn't really feel like they've necessarily solved anything but that's okay i like the tone here it feels like clerks meets apocalypse end of the world and very fun yeah i agree um, it's it oh sorry go ahead uh, go ahead go ahead it's it's cool it's creative it, you know they're having fun with it they uh, they're hitting their genre in such a uh a good way it just kind of it stays in its wheelhouse and does what it does and the or, art and story are are great together that's a kind of a seamless vision that is executed I, I think the Kevin Smith comparison is very apt and it reminded me of dogma mm. the movie that <laughs> Kevin Smith did that <laughs> yes embrace sorry it just feels a little ridiculous to be like it's like clerk meets dogma yeah, well, no, 100%. But it is, kind of, you're right. But Dogma is like Clerks meets the Bible, sort of. Sure. Um, and that's sort of what this is doing. 
um, in a nice way, but set in very much into the fast food industry. But this book, um, of a lot of books we talk about, really just maintained its tone and sensibility throughout of like fully into um, the clerk slacker uh, lifestyle while embracing these much larger ideas in a really cool way. And then coming back, not taking itself too seriously. Like this was such a fun, unique book, I feel. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point in terms of the big ideas. I don't want to underplay the fact that they're saying some very interesting things about religion, about consumerism, yeah. about just fast food as, I don't know, I want to say genre. That's definitely the wrong word, but in terms of a a thing in society. Well, I, I think fast fast food as like religion or as like yeah. where you worship on a, if you like, if you're someone who gets your coffee at Dunkin' Donuts every day, that's like your thing. That's like your yeah. a belief you have. And I think that's sort of the point. There's this great run at the beginning where it sort of talks about the religious religiosity of the fast food orders that the people are having here. And it's really cool. Yeah. Great book. Definitely check it out. Even if you didn't get it in single issues, pick it up when it eventually is in trade. Next up, Vanish, number four from Image Comics, written by Donny Cates, art by Ryan Stegman. In this issue, we're getting some big moves going on yeah. as our dark wizards who are masquerading as superheroes are once again going up against our hero, who is actually mm -hmm. sort of a villain, kind of, and we get some hints that some bigger stuff is going on in the background. I've been a little critical of this book for going too slowly. That all changes right here in this <laughs> <Yeah>. issue. <laughs> no yeah. slowness here. I mean, uh, honestly, okay. this is if you're a uh, if you're a Mark uh, Millar, Mark Miller fan, mm -hmm. um, this book scratches that itch without being so um, stupid. I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was trying to not be like crazy. I just engaged Mark Miller fans without really um, shitting on them. But it, it's not about stupid, I guess, but it's more about just absolute dedication to one idea without embracing any other uh, potential stories here. This book has a little bit of a wider lens to it, but it still is like it has that Mark Millar central focus on like big superhero action with a big central premise. Our main character has a, a, a moral line that is slipping and we're trying to keep a hold of it along with them, which feels very signature to that, but done in a way that feels different. It's definitely not a ripoff by any means, but if, if you're a fan of that, this is a book to pick up. I, yeah, holy fucking shit, this is an intense story, man. I mean, this was some over-the-top fun. Uh, you know, spoilers here, but this last words being like, fuck magic, uh, that's crazy fun. Great stuff right there. Uh, tons of blood and guts. Uh, yeah, this is just crazy in a good way. Yeah, I think you're apt with the Mark Millar comparison. I'll also throw out there the same one that I did the last time, I think, which is this feels like a vintage Top Cow book that just never came out. Very much mm -hmm. reminiscent of The Darkness in particular, but even bloodier and grosser, like Pete was saying. There is a panel here that ranks among one of the most disgusting I think I've ever seen. And yeah, it it's cool and gross and it's good. You really get to know this guy's nerve endings. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Speaking of which, Wolverine number 28 from Marvel, written by Benjamin Percy, art by Juan Jose Rip. The Beast has taken control of fuck, Wolverine. <laughs> this guy, they should be friends. They have similar hairstyles. Beast and Wolverine, yeah. Yeah. That's similar bushy, triangular, rhombusy mm -hmm. hairstyles. And the Beast is being a monster. So Beast has essentially neutered Wolverine, reduced him to a dog-like steak where all he can do is kill for Beast. We're getting a little bit of narration of what's going on in Wolverine's head, and Beast is pretending to Sage that the idea here is an experiment to find out how much Wolverine can regenerate from this sort of thing, this sort of, uh, he, he was brought back to life by the five, but not with all of his brain, so they're curious to see how his healing factor will work. Whether that's a lie or not, we don't necessarily know, but probably not, because Beast is using him as a covert assassin. I think the things that Pete really liked about this book in particular is Beast being evil, Wolverine being neutered, and that most, if not all of it, takes place in Krakoa. But I'll throw out there on the gross visuals, and nobody does it. I know we just talked about the last book, but nobody does it like Wado is a rep. There's disgusting, blood-soaked yeah. stuff in here. It, I think this run is so dark and unnerving the entire time. 
I'm fascinated to see where this goes and how it ends up because it ends in an even darker place by the end here. But if the ultimate mission statement is how Wolverine gets out of this, you know, that's what the best superhero stories are based on. So I'm really curious to see where this goes. I'm sure my good friend Pete is as well. So uh, I'll speak for him and then we can move over to Justin's opinion. No, uh, (laughs) this is a horrible issue. This was really bad. This was absolutely garbage to read this was such a bullshit issue beast keeping wolverine in a pit and it's not even the same pit that saber tooth is in on this stupid island which would have been a cool idea if they were both trapped in the same pit and what that would have meant that's not where we went this is just uh, this is abuse this is just uh, you I, i don't know if you can come back from this and I, it was just so upsetting to read, and I couldn't believe what I was reading, and then I couldn't believe that you put this in the fucking stack. Like, what the fuck was this? Can I, can I just say something? This? And this is not specifically addressing your last part there, but I do want to say Beast is keeping Wolverine in a cave, which is more of a sideways pit. Mm. That's the only thing you can say to that, huh? That's, I think, the only thing that's relevant here. Justin has an awful issue well here's the thing like because i understand pete you're upset about the content of this issue because i would argue the art's really good this is a story that's well told who cares if the art's good if it's a fucking shitty story yeah but you don't like what happens to your character so i think the story is well told that's why it's having you're having such an emotional reaction to good about this because you don't like that Kelsey Grammer's primary character is being <laughs> oh shamed god. so much. Oh my god! What you're saying, because dude, a if there was a, a comic about uh, somebody you cared about being tortured, you like would my think, "Oh, Pete this LePage? is a cool story." Like if there was a great. comic, if about my friend Pete LePage who was being tortured. Uh, yeah, I, anybody you cared about is my point. Pete, Pete the page. I, my biggest, I, I didn't want to bring this up, but the biggest thing that I'm upset about, and this is kind of pivoting off of what you said, Justin, I have a pretty popular fanfic on AO3 that is all about Frasier imprisoning and torturing the greatest showman. And oh, this okay. feels like this is straight up ripping that off. Uh, wow. This is ripped off. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there, I will say, Alex, there is that episode of Frasier where Frasier imprisons Niles, <laughs> in a, um, a part of the, and Niles is sort in of the Wolverine. Pit. He calls him he's sort of the Wolverine of Frasier. You know what I mean? Like he's always he is, waiting. He is the best there is, and what he does, and what he does uh, is very nice. Yeah. What he does is sip uh, casually. Bore sip people to death is what he does. <laughs> Wow, anti Fraser take is welcome from Pete. Pete's just on a tear. You know, um, Sage I, is sort of like the Daphne of this whole situation. You know, that makes the most sense of anything we've said. Um, I like this story. I think this is pushing. What? Uh, this is pushing the. I don't didn't expect the story to be coming here, um, and this made me think because I think they talk about uh, maybe it was in the X Men Annual a little bit as well. Where so it's you. Like, you wrote a comic where somebody's being tortured and you're like, oh, this is interesting. I really like this. Well, it is interesting. Is... He's going to come out it's, of it. He's it's going not to interesting. his revenge. It is it's, interesting. It's it... horrible to do this, this is, to somebody. So uh, hold on just for a second, because this is a very frequent conversation that we have here on the podcast. And I think the thing that we are trying to impress is not, this is good. This makes us feel good. It's, this is well done. It makes you it is purposefully built to, in a way to make you feel uncomfortable. Hard if you disagree. read this, hold on, let me just finish what I'm saying. If you read this and you were like, meh, then it's bad. Then it did that's not exactly do a job. Right. Then it's not, you read it and you're like, eh, that seems yep. to be your reaction so far as you're like, eh, I yep. wasn't affected by this at all. This is just, <laughs> you're just like, brush it off my shoulder. You did not just yell at us earlier. Didn't seem like, touched by this. Uh, anyway. No. Oh, okay. Uh, but- that's interesting. What I like about this is I think Wolverine's a character that especially recently has been hard to put him in a place where you're like, oh, no, he's in real danger, um, where you can be like, he has to do something to change this because he's been involved in a lot of like, he's either been sort of off the map where he's living on the moon, we get a little touch on it here where it's like he's up there with the Summers family and you're like, and crazy to me, we still have never heard that story about Krakoa and all this new X-Men stuff is like, hey, Wolverine, Cyclops, Gene, and Hope live on the moon together? What the fuck's going on up there? Like, does anyone know? We get a reference to it in this book. Yeah. And we still don't know what's going on up there. Tell that story. Why are we not hearing that story? That's like the reality show. I have some fanfic on AO3 you should check out. 
of uh, whatever James Marsden's character is from Enchanted, and also uh, Fabka <laughs> Jensen's character from Nip Tuck. And uh, the music man, and they're all together with the TBD character. I don't know who plays Hope in the movies or anything like that. Nice. And they all live on the moon together. And again, this ripped it off. Let me just say, Alex, you need to take a breather because the fact that you just rattled off all those three references, you deserve a little break because oh, that was not that was not easy. I'll tell you about why don't we take a break and talk about Batman versus Robin number four from DC Comics written by Mark Wade, art by Mahmoud Azrar and Scott Godlewski. This is finishing up the first big arc of this book as Batman and Robin fight almost to the death here, or actually spoiler to the death, kind of, uh, as the demon Nesda tries to bring forth a something and we get it revealed at the end i think you probably know it's coming because we already know this is spinning off into a lazarus planet crossover so there's some big changes coming for the dc universe based off of this but what did you think about the end of this first arc i thought this was uh, epic and crazy cool loved all the action and all the twists and turns stb toy of bananas art so uh i i thought the you know, spoilers, but Batman rocking the helmet of fate was uh, really badass. Great battles versus the demon. Love the kind of uh, sun uh, stuff. And uh, all, I, I thought the Tal- uh, Talia, Talia uh, team up. Yeah, Talia team up was great. Um, I agree. Like, Mark Way doesn't write a lot, of, a lot of comics these days. So when he comes in, you know it's going to be a banger that takes the characters that he wants to write, puts them on the table in intense conflict, but also brings in some great DC continuity elements. And like like Pete said, having the Dr. Fate helmet be a part of this, having um, a lot of both positive and negative aspects of the uh, Bruce Damien relationship on display here, Talia, all of it in service of a, of a crossover that we still don't know much about is very cool this has been a good four issue run-up i like this method of doing a crossover as well where you sort of bring us into a book that feels regular and it's just a great story that ramps into something even more exciting only two things that i'm going to throw out there and this is just Uh-oh. because this is just because of the release schedule this has nothing to do with the quality of the book was good but and this is spoilers but you mentioned the dr fate helmet that is a pivotal thing in the middle we just read danger street last week where the dr fate helmet on its own was a pivotal magical item in the middle of everything so it felt like okay we're doing this again which i know it's just coincidental that's fine yeah it's coincidental man get over it bigger thing to me that again i was like i wish the release schedule hadn't done this in this issue batman spoiler again dies actually dies to save robin the same thing that happened two weeks ago over in Batman when Batman died to save Robin. So I think this is just the nature of comic books and I get it, but it definitely he affected cares my about emo- Robin, dude. He's going to do affected my emotional experience of reading this book where I was like, eh, I kind of already saw him die doing that. So I'm not as upset this time. I think. Wow. Um, I mean, I, I, that's fair. I will say, I think I've developed a full brain silo for in between <laughs> the comics that I read where I'm like, Cool, 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 cool. Because this story does hang together very well. Um, you're, the things you're bringing up are that those are very real factors. Um, but I have nine nine hundred different little brains to read comics with. I guess delightful. Well, let's move on to one of your other brains with the Department of Truth Wild Fiction oh, Special yeah. from Image Comics, yes. written by James Tide on the Fourth, art Come by on, Martin JT Simmons. Four. Now, this is a one-shot focusing on Bigfoot. I, I got to ask a question, and this is just because we read a lot of issues of this. Maybe you can go to your brain silo, Justin. Was this yeah. a reprint of the Bigfoot arc? No. Yeah, no. no. This is a, uh, this, I yeah, think this is a new, new standalone story. This is a story. completely yeah. different story, yeah. Okay. And if you if you'll remember, back on the live show, I, rec- I said this is my bi- uh, pick of the week. Mm, okay, so talk about this. Wait. So I uh, just re- you didn't cut me out of the live show, did you? We did. Yeah. Oh, the live show, we just you cut me fully out of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it was very seamless. Wow. I can't believe you were able to remove every single word that I said. But uh, shouts to that work. Um, no, I uh, I think this is great. When this comic, Department of Truth, fave. Like talk about it a lot. Um, but I think what I love about this is it really shows that this can be 
standalone. Like it doesn't have to be the larger storyline that is mm-hmm. sometimes, especially I think Alex, you brought this up a bit, can be a little bit off-putting in its density or it feels like it's not moving forward in the pace that um, it should. A story like this feels right present with what's going on in the main title. But at the same time, telling it deeply, the letters that you get in this issue were like so heartfelt and and great and really uh, made for a story that was sad, indicative of the universe and pushing our characters forward, even if it's just a little bit. Yeah, I thought this was just an absolutely banger issue. I mean, just super tight nanners you know i just uh absolute masterpiece of bananas art i mean uh just straight up and down nanners you know what i mean just (laughs) just you 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 gotta let me let me just it's just so great to be alive in this crazy artistic world where that they create in every issue it's bananas it is absolutely just such a creative masterpiece that they've done in this department of truth i am blown away that they're still just cranking out bangers let me ask you pete is there a way that you could fast forward in your brain to sort of the final form of your banana commentary and just let us know what the final uh <laughs> I, terminology i don't know what's going to evolve into you know what i mean it just it evolves you have to use something I, I feel like it's going to be going to be like very straight face talking about an issue you love and you're gonna be like oh boy this was real but nom nom boop boop yippee <laughs> and i'm gonna be like that's a serious thing that my uh, contemporary journalist pete lepage just i am said. not a journalist never claimed to be yeah the more you talk about bananas makes me think you work in the produce section of a grocery store <laughs> <laughs> namor conquered shores from marvel written by christopher cantwell art by pasquale ferry this is continuing the post-apocalypse journey of namor and luke cage in this issue they make it all the way to Latveria and have a little bit of a dust up with some doom bots there what did you think about this one worth it for the art alone uh it's just really pasquale. amazing well agree pasquale ferry's art is fantastic um, I love the way uh, this isn't just a, a name or story. Like it really is expanding out the this particular post-apocalyptic universe to really touch on a bunch of stuff. We get some Frankenstein in here, which to me, I was like, oh, DC is usually the one that really does service to Frankenstein. So it felt a little weird because it seems like they're very similar takes on the character. This Frankenstein doesn't have a sword, but he's otherwise pretty similar to the DC Frankenstein. So I'm not quite sure how that all fits in. Um, It's Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, but I think we call him Frankenstein. I know like that's the discourse thing to say, but I think we just call him Frankenstein. Like when people are like, oh, P. LePage, that's that's, uh, Paul LePage's son. (laughs) It's like, well, no, but we call him Pete pretty consistently. So we don't need to really reference. Uh, Yeah, we get it. We get the idea. Who is Paul LePage? What's your dad's name? Bill LePage. Bill. Uh, Paul is very close to Bill, let me say. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. There's some asshole governor up in Maine I don't want to be associated with. I think that is Paul LePage. So. I was up there over the summer, and I really almost took a sign to take home for you, but I was afraid <laughs> they. I was afraid that people were going to shoot me for stealing it. Yeah. And they probably would have. You know what they would be if they did that is Total Berserkers, which kicks us into our next book, hey! Berserker number 11 from Boob Studios, written by Keanu Reeves and Matt Kent, art by Ron Garney. This is the second to last issue of this book, as a Big, crazy fighting stuff goes on, as well as some big mythology stuff. As we're starting to wrap up here, how are you guys feeling about this book? Justin? I feel like this book for the last several issues has been like our main character, our berserker, being blue and being screaming in blue electricity with like a jagged thing going into him for quite some time. So I was like, ah, we're definitely stuck in this. This feels like we're getting... This is the finale rack. But this issue finally moved it forward. And I was like, oh, no joke. We're there. He's mortal. The villain is now the berserker. Um, The next issue is going to sort of settle it all. Spoilers, Jesus. Uh, Well, but like, am I wrong in feeling like the last two to three issues felt like I've been a little light on story. And maybe that's was intended for us to really ride with this sort of suffering and uh, electrification of uh, our main character 
Yes, but I think it really pays off nicely. I love how kind of uh, tripped out this is and, you know, just uh, such a cool ending to this issue. Uh, the art is so unique and cool. It really makes sense. The kind of style they chose and is really showcased in this issue, I feel like. And it's it's fun. I really enjoy hearing Keanu Reeves' voice for the main character. Uh, and they put such a great team together for this comic. And it's one of those things where I keep kind of approaching this comic with crossed arms to be like, all right, let's see. Like, uh, is this still living up to this kind of like huge expectation and it is it is still doing such a good job with this character and this creative team and they deliver on every issue and yeah you know sometimes you got to be blue for a little bit you know you you gotta be, blue. gotta be blue you gotta be blue last but not least i hate fairy lad number two from image comics written by scotty young art by brett bean and this issue gert is finding out why she is being asked to head back to Fairyland. Turns out it's part of a nefarious plot by a businessman who wants to turn it into a theme park. Things, of course, do not go as planned, and she ends up in a very different place in a very different situation, as usual. I am very much on board with this sequel here. I think this is a new, fresh take on this character and this situation. It's still really fun, and they're just having a good time. I agree. I re- I really love the time dash it does at the end. That to me was what I was waiting for. Like, it feels like finally with this issue, finally, it's the second issue. Uh, we have everything on the table and we can really just drive forward into the story, which I really appreciate. Yeah, I think this is really fun. Uh, the characters and the, the world that they created is such a twisted kind of chaos in such a cool way. And the art does such a great job of m- matching the humor. Uh, each issue keeps getting better and better, and they're building towards something that makes a total sense. And yeah, spoilers, but the time jump at the end is such a cool choice. I'm excited to see what happens. And if you'd like to support this podcast and all the podcasts we do, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast on YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about comic books, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. You know, I think this TMNT book could be like a great taco show. I'm oh gonna my fill, I'm God, gonna fill stop. It put meat, it back. Meat put and it sour back cream. In the back and board. I love sour cream. Stop touching. Ah, no!